All right, everybody, let's try something that's a little bit different now because um, I've got my office here a little bit reworked at the new home we just recently purchased. And when I say recently, I mean over a year ago now. And I have to thank Haney Malmet for recommending that I actually get a better microphone so that the quality of the audio is actually better. So he always has fantastic advice for me and I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Haney. Go check out his work. His handle is Critical Care Now. And um, yeah, he's just a phenomenal resource. Today I'm going to be discussing acute pancreatitis. And the reason why I'm going to be discussing this is basically there was a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine on the 15th of September of this year. I mean, for historical context, today is the 27th of September of November of October. I'm going to get my months right. Don't do a mini mental status exam on me. I might not do well. But that paper is titled Aggressive or Moderate Fluid Resuscitation and Acute Pancreatitis. Hat tip to the authors, and I would tell you to read this article for yourself, but unfortunately, it's hidden behind a paywall and all the limitations that come with that. However, generally speaking, lots of institutions have access to the New England Journal of Medicine, so you should be able to get a, get a hold of it because at the end of the day, this is not medical advice, and I don't want you to necessarily trust me. But I'm glad that this article was published and the findings were reflective of the way that I am currently practicing. You see, the historical thinking of acute pancreatitis is to go ahead and bombard the patient with IV fluids as they come in dry. Many people ask, why is it important to even define fluids in acute pancreatitis? But when you go ahead and read the article, they state that moderately severe or severe disease develops in, quote, approximately 35% of patients with acute pancreatitis, end quote. Honestly, the data has been all over the place and the studies with acute pancreatitis and fluids have been sometimes small, sometimes conflicting. So the clinical gestalt has just been to go ahead and give fluids and worry about the consequences later. We have learned more about the consequences and challenges of patients with fluid overload over the past several years, which is why these authors decided to tackle for themselves the experiment of assessing how much fluid resuscitation would be beneficial to patients who were undergoing or who were suffering acute pancreatitis. With this particular format, I'm going to be digging a little bit deeper into the study than I normally do for others, simply because I find it to be quite important. And as I mentioned before, this paper is challenging to get your hands on unless you have access to the New England Journal of Medicine. That's, uh, that's my recommendation always that you should just try to read the article for yourself and not trust me. So looking into this a bit deeper, this trial took place in four different countries, India, Italy, Mexico, and Spain. And it's a multi-center, open-label, parallel group, randomized control, superiority trial. When you're looking at acute pancreatitis, you always have to wonder, how did they go ahead and diagnose this? And the way that they diagnosed acute pancreatitis included typical abdominal pain, serum lipase or amylase levels, amylase levels that were higher than three times the upper limit of normal, or acute pancreatitis on imaging, you know, when you see like stranding and all that on the CT scan. It's important me for me to mention how acute pancreatitis is defined because sometimes it's diagnosed with just a lipase or an amylase that's just slightly above the reference range. But here again, they used three times over the reference range. So let's do a quick, uh, let's do a quick breakdown of the two groups. There was a one-to-one -one ratio between the patients who were either in the aggressive fluid resuscitation group or, or the moderate fluid resuscitation group. One of the limitations of the study is that both, quote, patients and investigators were aware of the assigned trial groups, end quote. And this is a limitation because it does introduce bias. To define the two groups more specifically, let's start with the aggressive resuscitation group. These patients re received lactated ringers, also called LR, at 20 cc's per kilogram of body weight over two hours. Then patients received an infusion of three cc's per kilogram per hour of LR. To put this into perspective, a patient who is 70 kilograms would receive 1.4 liters of fluid over the first two hours. Then they would receive a drip of LR at 210 cc's per hour. Again, this is just a patient who is 70 kilograms. If a patient weighs, for example, 200 pounds, then we will be looking at higher numbers. Let's use 90 kilograms for the sake of simplicity. That would mean that they receive an infusion of 
270 cc's per hour. That seems like quite a lot to me for any type of aggressive fluid resuscitation. To be frank, even the most aggressive fluid resuscitators might not even give that much, but I could say, I could say that this is honestly quite extreme, thankfully. Both groups had a safety checkpoint where they would decrease or stop the infusion if there was a concern for fluid overload. Amongst the other goodies presented in the fluid resuscitation protocol, they state that checkpoints were performed at 3, 12, 24, 48, and 72 hours. If the patient was either hypotensive or had decreased urine output, the patient will receive additional fluid boluses at 20 cc's per kilogram. In the moderate fluid resuscitation group, it was far more moderate. Upon presentation, they would receive an infusion of 1.5 cc's per kilogram per hour. They would only get a bolus of 10 cc's per kilogram if the patient was deemed to have hypovolemia. Doing the same uh, math as looking at the aggressive fluid resuscitation group, that means a 70 kilogram patient would receive an infusion of 105 cc's per hour of LR compared to the same 210 cc's per hour in a 70 kilogram patient in that more aggressive group. So keep that in mind. Similar to the aggressive resuscitation group, the moderate resuscitation group received additional fluid boluses. If the patient had decreased urine output or was hypotensive, def defined as a SBP of less than 90, for example, they would go ahead and get additional fluids. The same checkpoints for safety applied here as well. Something else that's up for debate in some circles, not necessarily mine because I try to feed my patients who have acute pancreatitis sooner rather than later, is when to start feeding them. And one of the more recent evolutions of our management of acute pancreatitis includes starting oral feeding earlier in the course of the illness. Here they started oral feeding at 12 hours if the patient reported pain of less than 5 on a 0 to 10 scale. Fluids were stopped if the patient was able to tolerate PO for 8 hours. From what I'm seeing, this could be at 48 hours for the aggressive resuscitation group versus as early as 20 hours after randomization for the moderate resuscitation group. So let's take a quick look at the primary outcomes. And if they were here, here they were trying to see if there was a difference between the development of moderately severe or uh, severe acute pancreatitis, which is why the patient was, uh, while the patient was being hospitalized. Uh, let's take a look at the primary outcome. As their primary outcome, they were trying to see if there was a difference in the development of moderately severe or severe acute pancreatitis while the patient was hospitalized. It's, it's important to define what moderately severe or severe acute pancreatitis actually means though. It would need to include one of, one of the least, at least one of the following criteria from the revised Atlanta classification. These include local complications, exacerbation of pre-existing or coexisting condition, a creatinine of at least 1.9, hypotension with a systolic of less than 90 despite fluid resuscitation, and a PF ratio of less than 300, meaning that these patients start going to at least mild ARDS. They had a number of secondary outcomes, which I'll get into that later. They were able to recruit a total of 122 patients in the aggressive fluid resuscitation group and 127 into the moderate fluid resuscitation group. When looking at the baseline characteristics of these patients, it's always important to think about what your preconceived notions are with regards to the patient population being studied. What really caught my eye here was that approximately 50% of the patients were recruited were female. I must say that in my practice, the vast majority of, of cases of acute pancreatitis takes place in males. In addition, the majority of the causes of pancreatitis or was, was secondary to gallstones. You and I probably see more common cases of pancreatitis secondary to alcoholism or hypertriglyceridemia, more so than, for example, gallstone pancreatitis. I ran a search in the article to see if there was a reason why gallstone pancreatitis was more common than the alcohol-related pancreatitis in this patient population, but honestly, I was unable to find the answer. There wasn't much else in the baseline characteristics that caught my eye, so just keep that in mind. So let's look at the results, fluids in acute pancreatitis. When we look at the cumulative fluids received during the first 48 hours, the authors reported that the aggressive resuscitation group received a mean of 7.8 liters, and the moderate resuscitation group received 5.5 liters of fluid. Right here, there's a difference of over two liters of fluid. 
Given that we usually get fluids earlier in the course for resuscitation, the authors noted that, quote, the, the greatest between group difference in volume administration occurred during the first 12 hours, end quote. When it comes to the primary outcome, which is defined as moderately severe or severe pancreatitis, it was found that 22.1 of the patients in the aggressive group met this endpoint versus 17.3 in the moderate fluid resuscitation group. To the untrained eye, 22.1 seems like far more than 17.3, but it turns out that this was not statistically significant with a confidence interval that crossed the number one. This was both on the relative risk scale as well as the adjusted relative risk scale. I always tell people not to read the conclusions as the first takeaway to any journal article. Here's a great example of why you shouldn't do that. If you were to just read the conclusions, you would know that they do not mention the primary outcome. Instead, they mention that the incidence of fluid overload. So fluid overload, again, is not a primary outcome. It is a safety outcome and very important though. After all, we do not want to drown our patients or harm them. But in fact, if you look at the, all the primary and secondary outcomes listed on table two, which includes severe pancreatitis, local complications, incidence of invasive treatment, ICU admission, shock, respiratory failure, et cetera, you can see that there's pretty much no difference in any of these primary and secondary outcomes. Also, they had very, very wide confidence intervals. So let's take a closer look then at these safety outcomes because we have to find the harm in giving too much patience in in uh, acute pancreatitis. So returning to the safety outcomes, this is where the meat and potatoes lives in this paper. Here, the incidence of fluid overload and the aggressive fluid resuscitation group was 20.5% versus just 6.5% in the moderate fluid resuscitation group. I often recommend that these numbers be plugged into a number needed to treat calculator. Once we go ahead and do that, we would find that the number needed to treat to cause fluid overload is just seven. Interpret that number as you may, but I do have to say that the confidence interval for this finding is much wider than I personally would like. In addition, there were more findings of fluid overload, which you know, include edema, uh, pulmonary rails, and the aggressive fluid resuscitation group. But this should not come as a surprise. Things that were not statistically significant, but potentially due to the fact that these were underpowered include the incidence of moderate to severe fluid overload and dyspnea due to fluid overload. Given that the authors noted that they were causing harm to patients, the trial was actually terminated early, and I'm glad that they did. Perhaps they should have completed the target enrollment. They would have found differences in the primary uh, as well as secondary outcomes, but again, they stopped the trial early for safety of patients. The discussion starts off by saying, quote, this trial showed that aggressive fluid resuscitation increased the risk of volume overload, end quote. I'm personally really glad that the authors took on the endeavor of proving this. The rationale of, of recommending aggressive resuscitation in acute pancreatitis, which is in the current management guidelines, by the way, is now debunked. We do not need to bombard our patients with fluids. Utilizing a protocol similar to the one used in the moderate resuscitation group seems appropriate for our management of acute pancreatitis. Now, every patient is different, so therefore this is not medical advice and you should always use your best clinical judgment when caring for patients with acute pancreatitis or any type of illness for that matter. Let me know your thoughts and what you think of this article as you know, I'm just trying my best to, uh, to convey these data to you. And also let me know what you think about the new format. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks. Bye.